Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, ko Max Rashford toko ingoa. Uh, no Inglaterra uh, okutipuna. Uh, I tae mai okutipuna ki Aotearoa te tō uh, 1843. Uh, I tipu ake o ki te Tara uh, e nohana o ki te Whanganui Atara. Uh, ko tēnei taku mihi ki nga tanga te whenua o te rohe nei, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, welcome everyone, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Simon, and thanks very much for the chance uh, to speak here. Lovely to be addressing um, an organisation uh, with a name that I think really addresses one of the, one of the major issues facing us. Um, and yeah, as Simon said, uh, because I'm going to be talking about, you know, deeper democracy, a kind of democracy that really privileges the wisdom of the crowd and the give and take of public discussion, uh, I'm going to try to keep my uh, address, as it were, relatively brief, no longer than the time allotted for Q&A um, in, in the spirit of what we're all talking about. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about what I see as some of the major obstacles um, to better and deeper democracy in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, the, I've sort of highlighted six. Um, I could highlight far more, no doubt, but these are the ones that have really sort of stood out for me. And I'll go through them, of course, in time, but just briefly, they are a lack of information um, about how democracy might be improved, uh, a sense of apathy about the state of New Zealand's democracy, uh, difficulties understanding the place of deeper democracy in a country that's dedicated to power sharing, uh, the cost of doing things differently, the direct opposition to it, and finally, the, the sort of incorrect belief that we're doing all of this already. Uh, so those are the six obstacles that I'm going to talk about. Um, before I get into that, I just want to say a few words about what I mean by deeper democracy. Um, and obviously, that's not a particularly technical or an academic term. It's just an overarching phrase that I use to denote a way of doing democracy that is both more deliberative and more participatory. Um, obviously, participatory democracy is uh, a democracy in which more people are participating as citizens in the decisions that directly affect them. Deliberative democracy ensures that when people are making those decisions, it's done through public discussion, through listening, through reflection, through people adjusting their views in line with more persuasive arguments and better evidence. Um, and I like to say that participation is what empowers the crowd, deliberation is what makes it wise. It's what brings the scattered wisdom of the crowd to the surface. Um, and I think when you're doing democracy in ways that are more deliberative and participatory, you've got decisions that are simply better because more people are involved uh, they're fairer, they're more likely to favour the interests of those traditionally excluded from political processes. Uh, the decisions are seen as more legitimate because more people have been involved in them um, and they are more open and more transparent. Um, so I, I think these sort of these mechanisms have a lot of advantages and I imagine I'm speaking preaching to the converted here. Uh, also probably a lot of you will be aware that these forms, you know, increasingly being used all around the world. We've got, you know, climate assemblies in France and the UK, uh, participatory budgeting having spread out of Brazil some time ago. We've got Iceland crowdsourcing a constitution or trying to, you've got all these innovations. Um, whereas here in New Zealand, at least in the sense of how sort of our classic central government works, how the crown works, um, we've used relatively few of these new practices. Uh, there have been some bright spots and some people here in the room know more about that than I do, um, but relatively few. Um, and so it's really incumbent, I think, to, to think about well, what are the obstacles? Why have these things not taken off in New Zealand, in Aotearoa New Zealand, in the way that we might have expected? Now, the first obstacle, I think, and it's a really obvious one, but it's worth stating, is just people's lack of information about these different ways of doing democracy. You know, in New Zealand, very few people have heard about participatory budgeting or crowdsourced legislation or what have you. Um, the ideas that underlie, you know, deliberation, discussion, participation aren't necessarily new, 
but the terms often are to people. That's just a really obvious problem and it's incumbent on all of us to get the word out there about these ways of doing things differently and to explain their advantages. Uh, the second big obstacle I think is apathy um, and that comes in a number of forms. Uh, for some people that's probably actually a rational, well an almost rational disengagement from the political system, from people who, feel, who are very poor or, or who feel marginalized, who have legitimately lost faith in the idea that the democratic system is going to change anything profoundly for them. They are of course not going to be immediately engaged in these discussions. You know, we live in a country where someone in the wealthiest 1% is worth on average 70 times the typical New Zealander. People sense those inequalities. Um, they feel like you know, a lot of decisions are predetermined by people with power, so they're not engaged. Um, even amongst, I guess, sort of relatively engaged, relatively affluent people, there's a different kind of apathy, which I think is a kind of um, complacency about how good democracy already is in New Zealand and this belief that we sort of have, quote, one of the best democracies in the world already. Um, because of course we do very well on the transparency, uh, transparency international corruption perceptions index on the economist intelligence unit, democracy index on all these kinds of measures. Um, and so obviously uh, it has to be pointed out, I mean, for all these groups, you know, firstly the transformative power, I think of deeper democracy you look at the way that participatory budgeting in Brazil is engaged in really deeply with people from poor communities. It delivers spending that is profoundly much more pro-poor than classic uh, political decisions. On the other hand, in terms of that sort of middle-class apathy, um, I think we have to point out that although you know, our political system works relatively well in terms of being free and fair, open elections, independent media, and all these kinds of things, actually we score much less well on measures of political culture and measures of political participation. Um, so just sort of starting to chip away at that complacency and that apathy. The third major obstacle, as I said, is I think a lack of clarity about the place of these sort of deeper forums of democracy in a country that's dedicated to power sharing between Māori and Pākehā. Um, you know, and that's a question about, well, how do, you know, if we're going to, if we're pursuing a country um, in which Māori can generally exercise tēnā ranga, tēnā tanga, including the ability to make political decisions for Māori, by Māori, how does that fit in with creating some of these deeper democratic forums, like citizens' assemblies that people might want to see? And I want to be really clear here that the obstacle is not the ambition for power sharing, which I think is extraordinarily important. The obstacle is our lack of clarity about how we resolve the place of deeper democracy in Aotearoa New Zealand. Uh, to give just one obvious example, if you held a citizens assembly today at a nationwide level, it would have, might have 100 people. Māori would be 15 people on that citizens assembly would be again in the minority, would again run the risk of having their views overridden by the Pākehā majority. So not understandably, this, this is you know, causing people some, some difficulty in trying to work through these issues. Um, I haven't been on the front line of those discussions. If there's anyone here from Te Reo Ngai Tangata, the people speak, I'd be very interested to hear their perspective on this. Um, but I know that people from the Pākehā side are struggling to work out what's the appropriate solution here. And while I can't obviously speak for people on the Māori side, just from reading what people are saying, there's obvious skepticism about some of these models, um, you know, a understanding desire to focus on building the institutions that are by Māori, for Māori, and all these kinds of complexities. Um, not least because I haven't been on the front lines of these discussions, I don't have an absolutely clear answer, um, nor would it probably be appropriate for me to try to pose that here in this way. Um, I suspect the answer lies in some kind of combination of different forums and different institutions. It could be that if you want to run a citizens assembly, for instance, you run that in parallel with a more purely Māori driven process, or that your citizens assembly is reporting to bodies that are 
separately, Māori and Pākehā, or some other combination of those, or finding other ways of amplifying the Māori voice within those discussions. Um, or it could be that, you know, I've been influenced quite a lot by the Matike Mai report, the process led by Margaret Muto and Moana Jackson, uh, which, as you know, some of you will know, talks about the need for a rangatiratanga sphere where Māori make decisions for Māori, a kāmanatanga sphere where Pākehā make decisions for Pākehā, and a relational sphere where two cultures work out the policies that affect all of them. And it may be that some assemblies, you know, have a role of fitting in to, you know, the kāmanatanga or the relational sphere, potentially. Like I said, I don't have all the answers there, but that's a really significant issue that has to be addressed. Um, a fourth major obstacle, again, this is a very obvious one, is the cost um, of doing democracy better. Uh, SINs assemblies in particular are very expensive uh, compared to, well, at least are perceived to be very expensive compared to other forms of doing things. Participatory budgeting processes take a lot more work on the part of local councils going out to communities, um, asking them, you know, to make these trade-offs, scaling up, you know, sort of neighbourhood meetings into ward meetings and then citywide meetings. They're much more involved processes. Um, and, you know, and, and we face the sort of the, the tension, the conflict that I think a lot of these processes would logically work best at the local level um, because people's expertise in their own lives is most relevant there. But at the same time, local government is the most underfunded sector of New Zealand government and is a very, in a very weak financial position to make these kinds of investments. Um, I think the answers there are going to involve things like, frankly, central government stepping up to the plate more, doing things perhaps like what the British government has been doing in the last couple of years, which is creating a sort of innovative democracy fund the local councils can apply to to run these kind of deeper democracy processes in their local area. Um, but I think we also need to make the case for investment in these kinds of processes. Um, I think we can think of them as forms of infrastructure, democratic infrastructure. You know, and here in Wellington, um, we're of course having a huge debate about the state of our water pipes uh, and the disastrous lack of maintenance of those. And we're seeing what happens when you don't maintain your infrastructure it degrades and then you get fountains of water popping up here, there and everywhere on the streets of Wellington. In a similar way, if you don't invest in your democratic infrastructure, you get a rundown, a poorly maintained democracy that starts to blow holes that doesn't work as well as it should do. Um, I think we can also, particularly for more conservative people, make a cost saving argument. Yes, these processes are more expensive upfront but there's some evidence that they lead to savings further down the track. After all, and I've seen this locally, there is nothing more expensive than going ahead as a local council, making a decision without engaging people properly, uh, doing the wrong thing, then having to dig it all up and do it all over again. Um, and, you know, and I think these forms of deep democracy like participatory budgeting, you know, involve greater transparency, greater scrutiny of decisions, I think that's likely to lead in the long run to more cost effective decisions as well. So there's some good arguments there to be made. The um, fifth major obstacle that I think we face is outright opposition um, to doing things differently, particularly from politicians. And again, people from groups like Te Reo Ona Tangata, um, Ona Tangata you know, have experience of this, of the difficulties of trying to engage politicians and facing quite a lot of pushback. Um, and, you know, and there is, of course, a sense in which I think politicians will find this threatening, because although these forms of deeper democracy would actually always exist as a complement to traditional forms of representative democracy, uh, politicians often don't like giving up any power at all. Um, they can be nervous of the consequences, nervous of losing control of the agenda, or just simply feel threatened um, by the whole process. For me, the key thing is to make it clear to politicians that this is not about doing away with their role. It's just simply creating a different role for them, one in which they spend more time as the facilitator of the community search for solutions, 
rather than the deliverer of solutions. Uh, that's not always going to be an easy sell, but that is that is you know the the reality. Um, and I think the point that can really be made for politicians is that this is also a really profound way to increase long term trust in them. Um, because although trust in government in New Zealand is relatively high, certainly for a um, for a Western uh, nation, uh, actual trust in MPs themselves is very, very low, as I'm sure you're all aware. Conversely, you know, I think there's good evidence, um, particularly from some of the deeper democracy practices that have been carried out in the United States, that citizens who take part in these processes come out of them with greater trust in government and the system generally. You know, especially if those processes involve them engaging in some way more deeply with politicians, people come out of those forums measurably more likely to say, yes, I trust politicians. Yes, I have trust in this particular policy. Yes, I have more trust just in the system as a whole. So there, there's a real long-term benefit for politicians if they're willing to take that little step into the unknown and possibly give up a little bit of decision-making power in the short term. And I think that's a really important argument to make. The last obstacle um, that I've really seen out there is the one that I call, um, we've already done this. Um, and it's a, it's a belief I've encountered that governments and particularly local government are doing things right already. So when I wrote a piece last year about the situation with housing in Wellington uh, and the sort of, you know, what I think is the very uh, almost sort of toxic uh, oppositional debate, if you can call it that, between people who want greater densification and people who don't, um, you know, I proposed a method that, you know, I think there's some evidence has worked in places like Seattle, where councils work really deeply with communities that are earmarked for greater density of housing. And by giving the communities control over that process, they actually find a way for the community to come up with plans for densification that are what the council needs, but which residents themselves can live with. Now, when I proposed this, the overwhelming, well, one of the overwhelming responses was, oh, but we've already consulted with the community. You know, so a lot of people think they're already doing things right. Um, when of course, you know, what they mostly will have done is a relatively sort of tick box consultation process, maybe something slightly better than that, but probably not much better in reality. And this sort of circles me back around to where I started, I guess, this view is a combination of a lack of information, um, you know, a lack of actual sort of understanding about what these new forms of democracy might mean, uh, combined with an apathy, you know, a belief that things are already being done well. And so I think the challenge there is to not to demonize sort of existing forms of consultation, which can of course be done well, you know, there is a role just for your, your classic consultation process, but to make clear how different it is from the things we're talking about, you know, how different it is, not just in terms of participation, but in its lack of deliberation, you know, this single person sitting by themselves in their, in front of their computer, filling out the consultation online, is very different to someone who's listened to a whole lot of arguments in a citizens assembly or a citizens jury and has come to a really you know deep conform uh, informed considered position so i think we have to point out the differences between these ways of doing things and just gently try to shift politicians further you know up those sort of ladders of participation uh, and deliberation so that's that's some of the key obstacles as i see them I'm sure those aren't all of them. I'm sure there's plenty of others that people have encountered. Those are just some of the ones that have been most visible for me so far, sort of observing the scene in New Zealand. Um, I think that, I mean, I, I, you know, I think th these are real obstacles um, and we have to confront them, but I hope it hasn't been too downbeat a talk. I hope at every stage of the way, I've given some hints about how I think we can move through um, these objections and these obstacles. I know that's something you're dedicated to, and I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation in future years. Thank you very much.
Right, great. That's fantastic. Thank you, Max. Um, brilliantly succinct. Um, I think you've covered off <clears throat> some of the, the critical um, issues that, you know, anybody interested in, in, in deepening democracy has to face. Um, we've got some questions, um, so you're quite prepared to neither fire them at you. Um, if they're reasonably broad, so I'll probably go through them individually. And do you want to just respond to them individually as I throw them at you? Okay. So we do we we, we do have a question that um, probably picks up on well sort of relates to them all um, the barriers. But but um, somebody's made the the comment and and asked the question about look there could well be some losers in this game particularly those who tend to hold um, significant amounts of power. And they've indicated groups like Fed farmers, wealthy tourism operators, property developers, you know, the list can go on. So um, first of all, they, they, they want to know how would we address these kinds of um, groups that hold significant power in the community? I mean, I, I guess the question might be like, um, would they be prepared to engage or, you know, how, how do you sort of um, um, temper that? And, and the sort of, and so what actions following out of that, what actions can we take to deepen our democracy with the knowledge that there are um, strong um, <clears throat> elements of power in the community? Yeah, thanks. I, I think that's, that's a fantastic question and it, and it is an issue. I mean, I'd, I guess I'd say a couple of things, though. One is I feel like that's a bit more of an issue for further down the track. Um, you know, I don't think at the moment, you know, Fed Farmers, for instance, is blocking the introduction of these forums because, frankly, I don't think Fed Farmers knows a lot about them. Um, they're too busy blocking other things that need to happen, uh, dare I say it. Um, so, you know, I, th I think the issues are much more just around the sheer sort of apathy and lack of knowledge of these forums at the moment. Um, I would also say that I don't think um, those groups will necessarily be opposed anyway. I mean, one of the nearest things to this kind of, you know, these forums that, that I'm talking about that were seen in New Zealand was the um, Land and Water Forum, which some people here will know a bit about. Um, I'm not an expert on it, but it, you know, it was a, a forum, I mean, it involved sort of representatives of NGOs and things rather than ordinary citizens, but it was about bringing people together in a deeply considered process to talk across their differences. And the thing, you know, that involved federated farmers alongside environmental groups. Um, and the thing is that forum was really successful, as I understand, and worked well. And the problem was that the national government then sort of basically cut its feet from under it by not actually implementing its recommendations. Um, so, you know, so I think there's potentially to bring even quite powerful groups to the table. Um, if in the long run they started to see this kind of agenda as a threat to them, I mean, I think we need wider reforms to our democratic system. We need to, um, you know, we need to sharply limit the amount of money people can give to political parties in donations. You know, that's a weeping festering sore. Um, I think we need to reduce economic inequality as well. You know, as long as there's huge inequalities of wealth, there will be inequalities of power. That's unavoidable. Um, but for the moment, I think we just need to focus on building up people's knowledge and sort of addressing their apathy and complacency around these forums. Right. Okay. Um, so Jeff has um, wanted to sort of put, um, press a little bit more on that that initiative or that that idea that you put to the council, I assume it's the council on the, the, the Seattle housing um, approach. Um, and given that we're talking, we were sort of leading on to what actions could you do? Could, could you just go into that a little bit more? What what, what, what would that have involved? Um, so again, not a process that I'm fully expert on, um, but I've read a couple of um, pieces on it. Basically, um, the situation that Seattle was facing was that it needed to densify, but previous, uh, have, you know, more dense housing, but previous attempts to get that over the line uh, had been sunk by your classic sort of NIMBY reactions. Um, 
but then in the 90s they had uh, I've forgotten his name but a guy who's quite legendary community organizer involved in their engagement um, and he basically led a process whereby they hired a whole bunch of really sort of community community engagement people who spent a long time just building relationships with communities trying to heal fractured relationships and they then sort of gave community groups budgets so a bit of funding and support to basically draw up their own plans for densification um, and those community groups had to prove that they're actually engaging everyone in their area not just the usual suspects and you know they had to sort of present the plans at sort of ideas fairs and they had to send copies of sort of the proposed you know densification plans to everyone in the neighborhood um, and they were given lots of support lots of tools basically so they could become citizen planners um, and what happened was that you know even though you know classically people sort of dig in and defend their own interests and planning processes when it sort of opened up and they were told look you're in control of this process that just sort of eased people out of their defensive stance and basically got nearly all of them to put forward proposals for densification, which added up to what the council had estimated that it needed. Um, and then funding for, you know, those planning changes within, was then passed through various sort of propositions. And one of the articles I read argued, in fact, this sort of turned the whole, you know, large chunks of the community <laughs> into this pro-densification force that then went out there and voted for pro-densification of housing candidates. Um, the point that's been made to me in criticism is that that certainly hasn't solved all of Seattle's housing problems and housing is still quite unaffordable in Seattle. I'm sure that's true. I'm not saying this system was a, a magic bullet, um, but I think it had a lot of advantages over, you know, the classic planning processes, which just turn into people shouting at each other and digging into their entrenched positions. Thanks, Max. Um, so there are, are a couple of um, question comments that relate to, I think, the, one of the really earliest points you made about how this fits in with uh, Tina Rangatiratanga, the treaty, you know, a, 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 maybe a bit of a suspicion of these, these methods, deliberative democracy, really can it deliver for Māori. Somebody's made the comment that well, you know, why should, you know, a minority of people have the ability to um, um, have a, what would, on a numbers basis, be an, a, a, an over-representative kind of decision-making authority or, or power? Um, and I know you've sort of addressed that to some extent, but I'm putting that out there, that that is a concern to some people in the community. And then somebody's come through and, and, and I think picked up on something that you did mention as a way of sort of trying to address that is, um, I mean, I know, we, we know that in, in often in um, citizens' juries, you, you do, you know, you, your sampling techniques can help address mi minorities' issues in terms of representative um, percentages or numbers or whatever. Have you got anything to to uh, elaborate on on some of those techniques for ensuring a that minorities can be be adequately represented, even though you know um, uh, yeah. So, are there any techniques that you, you're aware of? And then, secondly, yeah. just to come back to that point about concern over you know supposedly you know overriding the wishes of the majority. Yeah, look, I mean, it's it's a really, they're really, really tricky questions. Um, and I'm not sure that on this field, on the specific point, I've got a huge number of answers. Um, I've probably got more questions here than I have answers, but, you know, I think that's fine sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly a lot of things, and, and you'll know this, John, of course, um, that you can do to ensure that these kinds of forums work well and are inclusive. And of course, often facilitation within these forums is crucial um, to ensure that everyone who's there, or first, you know, you have your sampling, so these forums are representative of the whole population, you know, so they're balanced on a gender basis and all the rest of it. 
But you also need really good facilitation to ensure that people who wouldn't normally feel comfortable speaking up do feel comfortable. Uh, and it's not just people from my demographic who feel very comfortable speaking, uh, who, are who are dominating the proceedings. Um, you know, facilitation is absolutely crucial. But that obviously doesn't solve all your questions about the basic numeric sort of issues. And look, those are really complex and it's going to be difficult to solve them because that is <laughs> one of the massive fault lines of sort of democracy more generally, you know, certainly, you know, as it's practiced in the West, which is that there's always this uneasy tension between the decisions of the majority, which is how politics mostly works, versus the protections for the minority. You know, so we carve out these things like, you know, all the essential sort of basic liberties, like freedom of religion, you know, so that even if you're in a minority religion, that can't be overruled, as it were, by the majority. You know, we're always trying to operate these things in an uneasy kind of tension um, and balance minority interests while sort of, you know, broadly speaking, having ruled by the majority. You know, and the sort of deeper democracy issues are no different to that. Yeah, look, I don't really have a clear answer. Um, except to say that I think, you know, I think there's a really positive story here. You know, I've been talking about sort of, you know, Western construct, constructs of deliberation and participation. And there's a lot of really great values in those traditions, values of inclusion, fairness, mutuality, turn-taking and speech. Um, you know, and that's the tradition that I work in. But of course, there's, there's a huge, long standing and in indigenous Maori tradition of you know, of hui, of korero, of fai korero, turn taking and speech, of considered consensus based decision making. The Matike Mai report that I mentioned earlier was itself developed through what sounds like an incredible process of, you know, what I would call deliberative democracy, something like 250 hui up and down the country, you know, taken to put together that report. So I think there's really fantastic traditions that we can draw on from both the Māori and the Pākehā spheres. And I think that if we just work, you know, with good faith, faith and with, you know, an acknowledgement of the importance of power sharing and tēnā tanga, that we'll get to a good position in these debates eventually. Yeah, well, certainly I'm getting, a, um, you know, a few comments from people like Phil Saxby from Aotearoa Climate Emergency, you know, who are working very closely with Tangata Whenua. And so hmm. there, there seem to be, you know, quite a number of different groups and organisations, and you will be aware of many of them. Um, yeah, yeah, that, and can I just, and can I just reiterate, John, I'm, I'm really keen to, to learn from and hear from those groups, either now or some other time, about how they're getting on with exactly those yeah. discussions. So yeah, that, that's um, a useful thing. We can kind of network through, you know, some of those people. And, um, um, what else have we got here? Let's see if there's any way I can group them. Um, I mean, just to go. Uh, this is this is my question, but it, it, it built on other other questions and and your, some of your responses. I mean, given that the fact that you know large chunks of uh, uh, countries that we would compare ourselves are increasingly looking to you know very um, uh, forms of, of of public participation and deliberate deliberate democracy, I suppose, is the umbrella term. And you, you, you've obviously been through some of the the, the obstacles, the barriers. Um, do is there a, a lack or a dearth of um, scholarship, academic interest, and journalistic interest in this country um, compared to some of the other um, Western nations, Australia or the UK or Ireland or or you know European countries? Is that, is that being a bit of a handbrake? Do you think? Yeah, I, I, I suspect so to some extent. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't have a lot of, you know, there isn't a lot of sort of, how can I put it, overly intellectual media. Um, it, you know, so there isn't, there aren't a lot of journalists who necessarily want to engage with these issues. Um, you know, and that's obviously different in places like the UK, where you've got sort of the, the quality papers, as it were, the broadsheets and, you know, the BBC, which is really powerful. Um, news outlet. So that's, that's a shortcoming to some extent. 
Um, yeah, and I think the the number of academics who are sort of active in this field, certainly in sort of you know in the Western tradition of deliberative democracy, is is pretty slender. Um, there's some good people like Matheson Russell at Auckland who are already starting to get cranking on this, doing some good thinking. Um, there is, of course, again, it's worth pointing out, you know, the completely separate sort of Māori academic traditions, um, looking at, you know, their own ways of decision making, many of which have similarities um, to deliberative democracy. But yeah, I think that's, that's a fair point. Um, but, you know, hard to really sort of immediately address any of those things. So you just have to work with the system as it is. Yeah, or not. Simon, how are we doing for time? I think we're just about at time. Maybe one more question. Right, okay. Who is going to be the lucky? Look, there's, as I say, there are a number of people who are um, <clears throat> um, filing into the chat saying, you know, they're, they're working with various groups, um, Māori organisations um, around climate change in particular. So I will feed those through to Max and you may want to you know, um, touch base with some of these people. So if I don't ask you a question or read it, your statement, guys, it's, um, that's my overview to Max and, and we'll get, we'll get um, the information to him. Um, Yeah, a number of people saying that, you know, public servants themselves are a significant barrier to uptake and transmission of these ideas. Um, and I think you sort of covered that particularly in reference to local government. Yeah, and I'd just say that that's come through when I've, I've had the odd session to, of talking to government, well, informally talking to groups of people at government departments about these issues and one of the things that people have said you know people have just frankly said to me god you know a lot of people at our ministry just wouldn't have the skills to lead one of the kinds of processes that you're talking about and you know it probably highlights the need ideally for a, you know a group in new zealand that's funded in the same way that groups are funded in other countries to actually you know do that slow process of building up the skills base um, around these kinds of processes Hey, um, can I ask a question directly, John? By all means. Uh, just um, I put that question about uh, what's the direct action that we could take or where should we put energy tomorrow if we wanted to promote um, deeper democracy in New Zealand? Um, what would be one thing that most of us could go out and actually do tomorrow that would make a difference? Ah. It's a really good question. Um, join Trust Democracy. I think there's there's a lot to be said for for joining for joining a group um, and working together because it, it's the sort of thing. It's quite hard. To, I mean, I don't I, you know I don't want to sound too downbeat, but it's quite hard to do much about as an individual. Yeah, I mean, so so join a group that you think is working towards this. Um, I mean, I, I think just just getting out there and spreading the word slowly, slowly, slowly is really important. I mean, that's how change happens in the long run. I guess also just thinking about maybe wh where are the options, you know, for where, where are sort of the, the cracks where the light can get in, as it were, to quote Leonard Cohen. Um, you know, I think sometimes people sort of go straight to things like citizens' assemblies, which are really big and expensive, well, they can be. I mean, I quite like the participatory budgeting model and you can start it so small. I mean, it can just be the council just puts up a bit of a chunk of money, you know, just in the 10, five, you know, a few thousand dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, either it would spend on grants and say, hey, we're gonna have a bit of a public process around this. You know, you put up your ideas, there'll be a bit of a public vote, hopefully an engaged, informed one. You know, start really small. So it's not that different to your existing processes. It's not too much of a leap for councils, you know, so if you have a local council or, you know, a local councillor or some local council officials that you think might be sympathetic to that, have a word with them, try to start it small, see what the enthusiasm for experimenting is. That's probably the best bet in the short run, I think. Well, on that note, um, positive note. Could I, could, I, could I just talk, could I just talk, 
from Christchurch, uh, it's Gary Moore here. We, we run a little group, it started off with 20 of us, and we run a little group called the Tuesday Club. And every Tuesday night, we discuss local topics, international topics, whatever. Uh, we send out a little email out every week, goes to 1,300 emails every week. And last night, we had 61 people debating the council's policy on global warming and a representation review. And the council staff that were there and the deputy mayor was there and, and the council staff that were there said it was the best public meeting that attended on both topics. So that's just a little group of people. And every week we have between 40 and 70 people turn up in a little bar and we have a drink on Tuesday night at Smash Palace and anyone can come and have a look at it if they like. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. Um, that I think will close the Q&A off. Look, Max, we really appreciate, um, you know, you, you've got a, a really good clarity of vision on this. I mean, you're not uh, pretending to provide all the answers, um, but you've stimulated our thinking, no doubt, and, and, and made us question even further because the, they keep pouring in. So really yeah. appreciate your input into this, um, into this, into this hooey tonight. Cool. Well, thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone else who's been involved in organizing this. Um, really admire your work. And I just want to say, um, obviously, I haven't sort of been able to follow the discussion properly in the chat, uh, but I've just done a cut and paste um, uh, so I can see what's been said. And um, looks like there's some fantastic information in there about progress people are making. So I look forward to reading up on that and learning a bit myself. So thanks very much. Kia ora, Max. Um, I'm just going to take um, license there uh, as chair. Um, I, I, I just wondered if, if you were aware of the uh, government's um, will to change uh, the way consultation is done. And um, if, if they are, then um, how, how would we begin that discussion? And how would government invest in change? Oh, um, well, I mean, my experience and uh, John and Simon and no doubt others have had this experience as well is that there's not a lot of enthusiasm um, amongst the current central government. Um, I think there's a few, um, literally maybe two or three ministers who have got some genuine enthusiasm for this, um, but even they really struggle to sort of prioritize it. I mean, one of the other big problems I could have talked about is just, you know, the chaos that is politics and, you know, the constant firefighting that they do and the lack of considered long term planning, uh, frankly, for an awful lot of things. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I just, I unfortunately don't think there's huge enthusiasm at central government level at the moment. So there's a lot of work to be done and sort of strengthening the resolve of the few ministers who are clued into this agenda and trying to spread the word amongst the rest of them. Sorry, that's not very optimistic, but that's been my experience to date. <laughs> that gives us something to work with. <laughs> Thank you. No problem.